This is an extraordinary time to be working in education in this country. And everyone here knows the challenges. Everyone here knows we have to get dramatically better. Everyone here knows we have an overwhelming dropout rate, 30%, 1.2 million kids every year going onto the streets. And I've said repeatedly, those students leaving school, they're not all going early to the NBA. Um, Bill Gates isn't recruiting them early from Microsoft. Those kids from Chicago and Detroit and L.A. and New York who are leaving in 9th and 10th grade, they're basically condemned to poverty and social failure. So there's a huge sense of urgency. And uh, uh, you could say we have an economic crisis in the country. I'd argue we have an education crisis, a crisis as well. In Rahm Emanuel, the President's Chief of Staff has this great line, never waste a good crisis. So we have a pretty good crisis in front of us. And, uh, <laughs> Crises are often times of huge opportunity, and it's often, frankly, when things are tough that you get the kind of fundamental breakthroughs you need. And sometimes those fundamental breakthroughs are actually harder when things are a little bit better. So the question for us as a country is, can we use this moment of crisis, make it an opportunity? We know the challenges, we know the hardships, we know the difficulties, but we also know what's possible. And I've been lucky enough to, to travel the country to see what's working and what's not. I can tell you, I'm so optimistic. I've never seen so many high-performing schools, so many great teachers, so many great principals. We know what works. We know what's possible. And for every school that has a 65% dropout rate, there's another school in a similar neighborhood with a 95% graduation rate. And 95% of those students who graduate are going on to college. And so I've always said the good ideas are never going to come from Washington. The good ideas are always going to come from great principals, great teachers at the local level doing the good work. And what we have a chance to do is to invest in what works and to take it to scale. Uh, we have $100 billion in new money for education. And money alone is never going to solve our problems, but money does help a little bit. And what we have, the department has never had before, is discretionary resources. I talked to Secretary Page. He had about $17 million in discretionary resources. We have north of 10 billion. Think about that, 17 million to 10 billion. 4 billion in the race to the top fund, 3.5 billion in school improvement grants to really turn around schools. I'm talking more about that. Money for technology grants, money for the teacher incentive fund, opportunity after opportunity, invest in innovation fund, $650 million. And what we want to do is find those states, find those school districts find those schools, find those nonprofits that every single day are beating the odds like so many of you here are doing and invest and take those things to scale. If it's working in two classrooms, let's take it to 10. If it's working in two schools, let's take it to 10. If it's working in two school districts, let's take it to 10. If it's working in five states, let's go to 15. And that's the opportunity we have. A couple things that are really, really important to us. We have to raise the bar dramatically. Our standards as a country are far too low. And I've argued that in many states, we're actually lying to children. When the state standard's been dummied down so much that meeting that standard doesn't mean much, I think we do those children, those communities a great disservice. And I frankly come from one of those states, where Illinois, where students who are quote unquote meeting that state standard are absolutely inadequately prepared to go to competitive university and graduate. They are barely prepared to graduate from high school. So we have to raise the bar. We have to do a much better job and be much more transparent about tracking our students' success and tracking their, their, their data over time. How much are students gaining each year? I'm a big believer in looking at growth and gain rather than absolute test scores. I think that levels the playing field. I want to know which teachers are helping the students grow the most. And I want to know which schools of education are producing the teachers that are producing the students that are learning the most and really being very, very transparent around that. In education, that's why all of you guys are here. Great talent matters tremendously. And how do we get great principals and great teachers into our toughest communities? There have been many disincentives to get the best and brightest where we need them most. We need to start to try and figure out a way to make that the capstone of folks' career, to go into those communities, inner city, urban, rural, wherever it might be, where the students and the communities that have to have the best and brightest to be successful will have that chance. As a country, we've talked so much about the achievement gap. I'm much more focused on what I call the opportunity gap. And if we can close that opportunity gap, I think the achievement gap will take care of itself. And then finally, we want to really challenge the status quo where schools aren't working. I sort of put schools in a couple categories. Our probably 10% of our, the top 10% of our schools are probably among the best 10% in the world. Phenomenal schools. And we should be learning from them and replicating those and sharing best practices. There are a set of schools in the middle that are improving each year, aren't at that elite level yet. We need to keep supporting those teachers and supporting those principals to get better. But I've tried to argue that as a country, we have 95,000 schools, call it 100,000, 
If we just took the bottom 1%, not the top 99%, if we just took the bottom 1,000 schools each year, the bottom 1%, and fundamentally challenge the status quo, stop tinkering around the edges, stop just playing with it, stop looking for incremental change, but did something dramatically different, that we could transform the opportunity structure for children and for communities that have been underserved for a long, long time. We have about 2,000 high schools in the country. It's not that big a number. 2,000 high schools that produce half our nation's dropouts. Those 2,000 high schools produce 75% of our dropouts from the minority community, our African-American, Latino, young boys and girls. That's just unacceptable. As a country, we haven't been open and honest about that. We have to be willing to challenge the status quo and do some things very differently where things aren't working for children. And I'm convinced if we can do all those things well, raise the bar dramatically, have good assessments behind that, think very, very differently about uh, clarity and transparency around data, if we can get great teachers and great principals working where we need them and think about turning around struggling schools, we have a chance to dramatically improve as a country. The president has drawn a line in the sand. The president has said by the year 2020, we need to have the highest percent of college graduates in the world. We used to have that. Go back a couple of decades. We've flatlined, we've stagnated, other countries have passed us by. I think we've paid a huge economic cost in that, and I do think this is a civil rights issue of our generation that we have to give our children a chance to chase the American dream, and the only way we do that is by giving them a good quality education. I'm convinced the dividing line in our country today between the haves and the have-nots is less around race and class than it is around educational opportunity. And children can be very poor and from very tough communities. If they have a chance to go to great schools, guess what? They're going to do just fine. And if they don't have that opportunity, there's nothing out there for them. So the stakes have never been higher. All those things work only if we have great principals in our schools. And that's why this work is so important. And I want to congratulate Wallace, and let's give them a hand for staying the course in this. So often, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but so often foundations come up with a great idea and do it for two or three years, and then they move to the next sexy idea, and then they move to the next sexy idea. And I think it's so important in education that we stay the course. What Wallace has done for the past nine years is shine a spotlight, and increasingly, actually, a larger and larger spotlight on leadership. And as everyone here knows, there are no good schools in our country without a great principal. Just, it's a cliche, it just doesn't exist. And I've found uh, throughout my time in Chicago quite the opposite, that you can have a great principal that can build a school slowly for 8, 10, 12 years and without the right succession plan, that school can be a disaster in like six months. It is much easier to tear this work down than it is to build it up. And so I want to thank Wallace so much for staying the course, for sticking with this. And if at the end of the day our 95,000 schools each had a great principal, this thing would take care of itself. Great principals attract great talent. They nurture that great talent. They develop that great talent. Great principal, bad principles, the reverse, bad principles don't attract good talent. They run off bad talent. Uh, they run off good talent. They don't find ways to improve those that are, that are trying to get better. They don't engage the community. Our principals today, I think, are absolutely CEOs. They have to manage people. They have to be first and foremost instructional leaders. They have to manage multi-million dollar budgets. They have to manage facilities. They have to work with the community. The demands and the stresses on principals have never been greater. And so we need to do everything we can to find a way to build that pipeline and to do a better job of supporting that pipeline. I'm really challenging ourselves, as this is what we're going to challenge everyone else around the country. I think in many of these areas, the Department of Education, frankly, has been a, a piece of the problem. We have dramatically underinvested in principal leadership. And from a budget of tens of billions of dollars, we put relative peanuts into principal leadership. And so as we go forward with our next budget submission, we want to find a way to really bring more resources to what we think is so hugely important. We want to think about the entire pipeline, how we identify the next generation of great, of great leaders to, be, to come into education, to become principals, how we also think about not just that early pipeline, but how we make the capstone of a principal's career going to a tough community. And in many places, your best principals end up in your wealthiest communities with the most privileged students. Not that those jobs are easy. Those jobs are very, very challenging. But we need the best talent on the front lines. And so how do we think about, as a country, how do we get 1,000 warrior principals every single year 
to go into communities that for 10 and 20 and 30 years, the dropout rate has been 60%. In elementary schools where students are falling further and further behind, how do we get that next generation of great principals to say the last five, the last eight, the last 10 years of my career, I'm gonna devote my life to turning around this school and turning around this opportunity structure for this community. So if we can do those things well, if we can really challenge the status quo, I think we can fundamentally break through. We want to be part of the solution. We want to change our behavior. I think Wallace is a huge part of the answer. And again, I just appreciate so much the spotlight here. And if we can get this piece right, we'll change our students' lives forever. If we don't get this piece right, we can do all the other big picture things we, we want. But if it's not happening in real schools, in real classrooms, we're kidding ourselves. Great principles make it happen, make it a reality day to day. And I want to thank all. Actually, could I ask all the principals here to please stand up? Let's give them a round of applause. All of our principals, please stand up. Our job is simply to support you. And a lot of us care an awful lot about education, but quite honestly, I'm not teaching any kids to read every day. Chris is not teaching any kids to read every day. You guys are. And if we can put you in a position to be successful, then we're, then we're part of the solution. If not, we're part of the problem. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Secretary Duncan. Uh, my name is Dale Chute. I'm from the state of Indiana. And uh, in Indiana, we've been um, undergoing some licensing changes to try to attract um, alternative um, or folks into leadership who normally would not uh, consider that path. And I would love to get your thoughts in terms of the idea of expanding the type, uh, pipeline yeah. outside of those who are traditionally from education. And again, not everyone agrees with this. I'm just a big fan of alternative certification, whether it's for teachers or for principals. And I just think we need more talent in education. And I actually, frankly, don't care where that talent comes from. Traditional paths, alternative paths, we just need the best and brightest to come into education. And again, there's nothing more important we can do than get great teachers and great principals into our schools and into schools that historically haven't had that there. And so I think we should have multiple, multiple pathways. I think we should evaluate over time and hold folks accountable which pathways are producing the best talent, which, which, ta which pathways are producing the real superstars. But anyone who thinks there's one path to success here, I think is absolutely missing the boat. And so the more we open this up, again, have a high bar, hold folks accountable, but the more on both the leadership, you know, the principal side and on the teacher side, the more we have multiple pathways, the more different types of talent's gonna come in. At the end of the day, I think the benefits for our students are, are huge. Thank you. Let me go in the back first. Yes, ma'am. Secretary Duncan, thank you. I am imagining myself as a principal at a 100% free lunch school, dual language, inner city. I have major challenges, and I'm wondering about your perspective on charter schools and parents who come to me and say, maybe my child would do better down the road at that charter school, and our school is making significant progress for our children in public education. As a principal, I feel significantly challenged by the conundrum of charter schools in the present day scenario. It's a great question. Again, not everyone agrees with my thoughts on this, but I just think as a country, we need more good schools. And I always say that uh, second graders don't know if they go to charter schools or neighborhood schools or gifted schools or magnet schools. Second graders have no idea. They know whether their teacher cares about them, they know whether they're safe, they know whether the principal knows their name. And I would argue in many poor communities, parents have had very few options, and often the option they have hasn't been a good one. And I often think in this country, what's good for wealthy kids is probably good for poor children as well. Uh, wealthy children in our country have had lots of educational options to choose from. Poor children have had usually one option, and sometimes it hasn't been very good. So I disagree a little bit with your premise. I think charter schools are public schools. They're accountable to us. There are tax dollars. I'm a fan of good charter schools. I'm not a fan of bad charter schools. Bad charter schools are part of the problem. Good charter schools are part of the solution. 
And the more good schools we have, particularly in communities that haven't had them, the better our students and families are going to do. And so where, school, where there's a high bar, let me just take one more second on it. What makes good charter schools? A couple things have to happen. This can't be a let a thousand flowers bloom. I think you have to have a very high bar to entry. That The charter authorizer has to be picking the best of the best. The chance to educate kids is a really sacred obligation. It shouldn't be given out just to anyone with an idea. Once you pick the best of the best, they need two things. They need to have real autonomy, they need to have room to grow, and they have to have real accountability as well. So in Chicago, we had five-year performance contracts. There are many charters that did a phenomenal job, but I also closed three for academic failure. And so we have a high bar to entry, where you have real autonomy coupled with accountability. I think they could be a piece of the answer. I can tell you don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Secretary Duncan, thank you. I'm Courtney Vandersek, and I'm the Assistant Executive Director for the Oregon Education Association, and pleased to be here with the Wallace Foundation as chair of our state Wallace Committee, the Oregon Leadership Network. And I appreciate your comments honoring great teachers and great principals. I have a more nuts and bolts question, because I also serve on the design team for our Race to the Top grant in Oregon. So I was particularly pleased to hear your comments about not all great ideas come from Washington. Uh, we believe we have great ideas in Oregon. But when might we know when the final regs are? And is it true that <laughs> Illinois is a sure bet for getting a race to the top grant? <laughs> I'll take the second one first. Absol absolutely not. <laughs> and let me, let me be just unequivocal here. We want to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in states and in districts that are going to lead the country where we need to go. It's as simple as that. And it's going to be nonpartisan and non-ideological. And we're going to frankly have a lot more losers than winners. And uh, my stock is going to go down precipitously. Um, but this is very, very serious. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, we're going to get final guidance out in the next couple weeks. We had thousands of comments. Um, I'll tell you, we have had staff literally working night and day, literally not sleeping, staying to go through. We've gone through every comment. The comments have been unbelievably helpful. I think the final RFP will be much stronger thanks to the feedback. But we've taken it very, very seriously and uh, appreciate all the thoughtful comments from uh, about 5,000 folks <laughs> around the country. Um, but again, folks may not believe this is going to be different, and I'll just say stay tuned. But I absolutely promise you, we're going to invest in those folks who not just in one or two areas, but in every area, can lead the country where we need to go. That's what we're looking for people who are willing to change the game in all those areas that we think can make a dramatic difference in students' lives. And it's the same thing I said to the earlier gentleman, we're not looking for the fanciest proposals. We're going to bring in the finalists and look them in the eye and look at their capacity and look at their track record. And if folks haven't done much in the past five or 10 years, it makes me a little less confident they're going to be you know, the, the innovative leaders going forward. If they've demonstrated a willingness to challenge the status quo and had real courage and had the capacity to get things done, that's who we're going to look at. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.